Hi everybody, my name is Bruce Kwan and I'm pleased to have this opportunity to share Asian Heritage Month reading with you today. I will be reading some passages from my book Bitter Roots, Five Generations of a Chinese Family in America. At a time when racism is now being discussed throughout the nation and particularly with respect to Asian Americans, my book describes the racism that occurred in America from 1850s to the present and how it affected my family. I will be reading some passages from the book and hopefully you will be able to understand why it is that what is occurring today with respect to Asian Americans and the attacks on Asian Americans is not anything new. Let me begin by reading some passages from my book. My first direct encounter with racism happened when I was seven in the company of my buddy Raymond. You and Raymond, be careful. Don't walk too far down Grand Avenue, Mom said as we were leaving out the door. Yeah, yeah, we echoed in unison as we ran down the front stairs that sunny su summer day in 1953. Walking past the Grand Lake Theater, the cigar shop, the diner and kosher butcher, we made our way to the end of the shopping district where Mandana Street emptied onto Grand Avenue. I had never been beyond this point. Let's keep going, I said to Raymond. Let's explore. Uh, your mom said not to go too far. Oh, come on. Like, there are no dragons or bad stuff. Ahead, I said, are you chicken? We kept walking past houses and an occasional store until I looked up and the street sign said, Oakland Avenue. Let's turn back, Raymond said, uneasy. Suddenly a car traveling in the opposite direction pulled a U-turn and screeched up next to us, scaring both of us. I looked quickly and saw it was a police car. One cop got out and stood over us. He was big and white. As we were taught, we never looked up from the pavement and only responded when asked, What are you, chinks or japs? And what are you doing here? I stuttered. Chinese. We were just walking down the street. You don't belong here, the cop responded. I heard the car door slam and the other cop got out and stood next to his partner grinning. I glanced up and saw him reaching for his billy club. As his partner put his hand on my back, pushing me to bend over, he placed his leather ticket holder on my back, and the other hit me with force, sending me sprawling. Then they hit Raymond the same way. As we lay on the ground crying, one cop said, if we ever catch you chinks here again, It'll be worse. Then we heard them laughing as the car drove off. Stunned, we lay there for what seemed like an eternity before slowly picking ourselves up. After the pain subsided, Raymond said, What was that about? Walking back home, I wanted to find out why the policemen did what they did, but was also afraid to tell my mom what happened. I responded, I don't know, but I bet that is why my mom said don't go too far down Grant, Grand Avenue. My mother noticed we were both upset. What happened? Afraid to tell her at first, I eventually spoke up. Through tears about the incident, chiding us, she said, didn't I warn you not to go too far down Grant, Grand Avenue into Piedmont? That night, I remember clear as day, asking my mother, what is a chink? Putting down the book of fairy tales she was reading, she paused and said, it's a word white people use when they don't know your name. Puzzled, I ventured, then it's okay for me to use it to greet a white schoolmate if I don't know his name? She smiled, no. It's a bad word white people use to describe you and me as Chinese people. 
they use it when they don't like you. Let's finish the story so you can sleep and be ready for school tomorrow. Boy, was I confused. My family moved to Oakland in 1906 after the great San Francisco earthquake and I attended Oakland Public Schools like you are doing today. However, during my time in school, from the 8th grade until I graduated from Skyline High School, those two schools, Ontario Junior High School and Skyline High School, were segregated by the school board. As a result, when I was in high school, my class had 700 members but there were only three African Americans, maybe 11 or 12 Asian Americans, no Latinos or Hispanics. And we minorities were ignored by our white classmates. We were excluded from their social events, and sometimes when we walked down the hall, some of them would say, why don't you go back to where you came from? Now, after I graduated from high school in Oakland, I attended the University of California at Berkeley, graduating from the law school in 1975. Now, let me fast forward to 1989, where I was now a practicing attorney. A quarter of a century after the groundbreaking passage of the Civil Rights Act, white institutional racism remain alive and well in America. Continuing with a passage from my book, when I was young, I thought all those racial slights and incidents were my fault, that I somehow wasn't a real American. In my lifetime, progress had been made towards racial equality, but somehow something always happened to remind me that racism was still alive and well in America. In 1989, as the interim city attorney of the city of Alameda, I was the chief legal officer of the city. One night after an unusually late city council meeting, I returned to my office upstairs in City Hall to prepare instructions for the secretary. It was nearing 2 a.m. in the morning. Leaving the darkened City Hall, I drove past police headquarters onto Lincoln and then to Park Street, headed towards Oakland. A block later, a police car pulled up behind me with its sirens blaring and lights flashing. I pulled over and rolled down my window. The police officer immediately left his car and walked over to my car door and in a harsh tone said, Get out of the car, boy, and spread them. I reluctantly got out and leaned over putting my hands on the hood as I was told. Very perturbed. Show me your license, he said, carefully, as I stood up and reached toward my back right pants pocket. I gave him my license, and he said, Get back on the hood. I glanced back and saw him looking at it with his flashlight. At the time, I lived in Berkeley, and maybe his tone was because of this fact. Then he said, not at all courteously. Boy, what are you doing here at this hour? You don't belong here. You belong on the other side of the bridge. By this time, I was furious and not wanting to speak while upset, held my tongue. He repeated his question, this time in an ac accusatory tone. I asked you, boy, what are you doing here? Moments passed before I responded. Officer, I am your city attorney. There was a dead pause, and then I heard him mutter under his breath, Oh, shit. Then the bullshit started to flow from his mouth. I really apologize for this mistake. I'm sorry to have stopped you, but you know, we have a report of an oriental male committing a robbery. Can I get off my car and have my license back, I said, still upset. Yes, sir, yes, sir, he said. As I turned to face him, leaning in close to his face, I said, You mean you have a description of an oriental male wearing a business suit driving a red sports car? 
He looked silent. He stood silent, knowing I had caught him in a lie. He looked away as I continued. Officer, you know racial profiling is cause for disciplinary action. I need your name and badge number. I'm going to have a talk with Chief Bob in the morning. Oh, sir, it was an honest mistake. Please don't report me to the chief. The next morning, still pissed off, I walked to my office, two doors down from the mayor's office. Through the open door, I saw the mayor, and he waved me in. Closing the door behind me, I began, Chuck, you have a problem, after which I described the incident. He slammed his hand on the desk and he said he would talk to Chief Shields. I gave him the information on the offending cop and said, If you have higher political aspirations, Mr. Mayor, you need to address this problem. Some time later, after I left the city attorney position, I remember hearing a news item on the radio about the Alameda police having been caught on tape denigrating African Americans, calling them, among other things, monkeys and jungle bunnies. After the initial furor, I heard no more about the incident. I didn't follow it up, guessing it had been swept under the rug, like many similar racial incidents involving the police. The incident rekindled many memories of my growing up in Chinese in America and often hearing my grandfather's warnings to me. Be careful, little one, Ye Ye would say. Be careful of what, Ye Ye? When you are away from the house, be careful of the low fun, white devils. Who are these white devils? How will I know one? Ye Ye, trowel in hand, was down on one knee patting the dirt around a rose bush. Stopping, he looked at me and said, the Luk Yi police are all low fun. They beat and shoot Chinese for no reason. You must be careful where you go. When I was a young person in San Francisco, if the Luk Yi found a Chinese person in the wrong part of the city at night, they would take him out to where the ocean was, use him for target practice, and after killing him, toss the body into the ocean. What Ye Ye said confused and troubled me. Why do they do this? Because they hate us, he said, patting the dirt into a mound. His admonitions had long been banished to the recesses of my mind. That is, until I read Driven Out by Jean Fowler, a book that was published in 2006 or 7. The author documented the ethnic cleansing of the Chinese in cities and towns of the western United States in the 1870s and 1880s. The book brought back more details of my talks with him. Grandfather's lessons focused on the need to be docile, submissive, and self-effacing. Make sure you lower your head as you speak. Make use of yes sir and yes ma'am. White people like that. It makes them feel superior, he chuckled, even if they speak only one language while we speak two. It eventually occurred to me that Chinese people born in America had become adept at modifying their behavior to conform to white-defined standards. It was why we became known as the model minority. Of course, it was necessary to survive in the white world. The reason I wrote this book about my family's interactions with racism in America since the 1850s was motivated by an article that I read in the newspaper in May of 2020. The article was titled, Coronavirus, What Attacks on Asians Reveal About American Identity. And this is what the article said. Attacks on East Asian people living in the U.S. have shot up during the pandemic, revealing an uncomfortable truth about American identity. Though she was not born in the U.S., nothing about Tracy Wen Liu's life in the country felt un-American. Ms. Liu went to football games, watched Sex in the City, and volunteered at food banks. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, the 31-year-old didn't think anything about being East Asian and living in Austin, Texas. Honestly, I didn't really think I stood out a lot she says. 
That has changed. With the outbreak of the pandemic that has killed around 100,000 people in the U.S., being Asian can make you a target. And many, including Ms. Liu, have felt it. In her case, she says, a Korean friend was pushed and yelled at by several people in a grocery store and then asked to leave simply because she was Asian and wore a mask. In states including New York, California, and Texas, East Asians have been spat on, punched, or kicked, and in one case, even stabbed. Whether they have been faced with outright violence, bullying, or more insidious forms of social or political abuse, in ant a spike in anti-Asian prejudice has left many Asians, which in the U.S. refers to people of East or Southeast Asian descent, wondering where they fit in American society. When I came here five years ago, my goal was to adapt to American culture as soon as possible, said Ms. Liu. Then the pandemic made me realize that because I am Asian and because of how I look or where I was born, I could never become one of them. After her friend's supermarket altercation, she decided to get her first gun. I hope the world never comes to a day when we have to use that, she says, adding, that would be a very, very bad situation, something I don't even want to imagine. Thank you for listening to me reading some passages from my book, and I want to wish you all the very best and great success as you finish your primary school education and move on to college, then through college, and on to your careers.